Good afternoon. I'm sorry to be separating you from happy hour, but uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. I, I really want to thank Michael and Katie, uh, and then today, especially Peter and Ozzy, for all their help. I feel like it's been a really good conference so far, don't you guys? And, and um, you know, we come to these things to connect. We come to these things to inform ourselves, to inspire ourselves, to get new ideas. And we come to these things to take a little bit of a breather. The one thing that unites us all is this idea of facilities. And so I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about you. Uh, what I want to talk about is you and your role with the university and what you do every day and how you do that every day. Um, you know, there's a, there's a looming question that all of us have from time to time. Uh, and that is, does what we do matter? Does what we do matter? Is it meaningful? And the reason we ask that question is because it's so tempting in our roles within the university to get caught up in the tyranny of the urgent, those things that creep in, right? The, the demands of internal customers and stakeholders the underperforming vendors, the deadlines, the budget cuts, you probably don't have those, but the budget cuts, the unforeseen problems, the tyranny, the urgent. And sometimes you just simply ask yourself, you know, is this all there is? And you probably identify with this guy, right? I mean, I don't know if this is what your Thursday is like, but, you know, sometimes all you can do is just whack the next mold that comes in front of you, right? But... I want to start philosophically, it's, it's really like my Thursday sometimes, I want to start philosophically and ask yourself in your role, in your desire to do something that matters, make your work matter, the question then becomes why do we build buildings or why do we renovate buildings or why buildings? So think about that just for a moment. Why do we do that? Now of course there's the functional reasons why we do that, right? Teachers need a place to teach. Students need a place to learn. Athletes need a place to develop. But stay with me just for a moment. So many times when we do those building initiatives, that's already going on. Oh, it may not be state of the art, but it's going on. It's happening. And I would just offer to you that in addition to the functional things that we program in, there's something else that's happening when we answer the question, why do we build a building? And that is, we're making a statement. We're communicating something about ourselves, about this community, about what we do. We're saying something. This press release about a new building didn't talk so much about the building. It talked more about what the building was saying. And I would just offer to you just for a moment to think about your role in this larger narrative of the campus. Your campus is really a collection of stories. And just as important as what is functioning within the building is the conversation about what matters that is really happening in the building. What are the generations of legacy? What's the, what's the memory of the building? What's the story of the building? And why is it different on our campus than it is on other campuses? Think about that for a moment. I would offer to you that at the end of the day, part of what we're trying to do is indeed tell a story or we're trying to move people. We're trying to create a place where something special can happen, where the conversation becomes, there's something special going on over there, or we've got to take the tour over there because you've got to see what's happening. Well, that's what we're trying to do, but so many times in that game of whack-a-mole, what happens is we're caught between the spreadsheets and the tyranny of the urgent, and it's so difficult to program in or to contemplate this idea of story and narrative. It's very difficult. And so what do we do? How do we approach that? Well, we think sometimes that'll just get naturally baked in, or I hope it gets baked in, or somehow we'll address it. Or sometimes we say that we'll hire an architect to put the narrative in, 
But what happens sometimes is the architect makes the narrative more about them, I'm getting just a couple of nodding heads, more about them than about you. In other words, they want it to be about their portfolio piece and their next job, right? So whose assignment is it? Well, it could be this guy's. It could be the tour guide's assignment, right? And you know that these are very sophisticated <laughs> tour guides, right? Student workers often, uh, you know, don't tell them what they did the night before or the day after. You know, they're, they're volunteers and they do their best job. But if you've seen the latest research, and we do a lot of research around students and what they prefer, the latest research will tell you that these tours need to get shorter and shorter. In other words, those stories might be missed on a narrative tour like this. And if you've ever been on one of these tours, and I encourage you to go on one, if you've ever been on one of these tours, they're extraordinarily presenter-based. In other words, they're not audience-based, right? They don't let the user define the experience. Last night, Kim talked a lot about millennials, and I would tell you from our research, even more so Generation Z, they're all about them controlling the experience and them having an experience. So. How do we do this? Now, there's something else going on, too. And the something else is what Gallup found out when they did a leading study just back in September of 2015. They reached out to your bosses. Gallup did, those smart research kids. They reached out to the presidents of universities, 4,200 of them, to try to determine what is the number one overwhelming pressing issue that, in our language, keeps them up at night. The single most important issue that they face is differentiation. Now that's a word we use often in our vocabulary, but let me just offer some level footing for our conversation. Differentiation means being different in a way that is authentic, but in a way that is meaningful and relevant to the audience. That's differentiation. Why is that so important? Well, it's important because these new buildings we build can, to the student and their family, look a lot alike, like our science buildings here on the slide. They're beautiful, they're state-of-the-art, but guess what? State-of-the-art's going to be obsoleted by the next state-of-the-art building down the road. So if this is an arms race, we'll never win, right? Somehow we've got to create this sense of differentiation in a way that's meaningful and in a way that connects with the audience. Somehow we've got to make spreadsheetable the concept of infusing story and narrative into the building in a way that's planned, in a way that's methodical. Now, people are doing this. I want to take you out to Southern California to a client that we had the privilege of collaborating with and tell you a case study about how we go about doing this. So the University of Southern California, as you may know, they play athletics. In fact, they play in 21 different sports, right? And they're good at it. And they've got a long tradition of it. In fact, lots of Heisman trophies, right? Five of them. So when they thought about the idea of building a new athletics building, well, they didn't have to do that because they were already having tremendous athletic success. There were already places for weight training. There were already places for performance enhancement. There were already places to tutor the student athletes. There was already places for nutrition. That was already there. But they wanted to build a building. This one, the John McKay Center there on U University of Southern California's campus. And they were doing it to say something. Something about themselves and something about the, com the, the community and to say something about the excellence that is USC Athletics. So we collaborated them on how do you infuse the story so that it's not just a building, so that it says something meaningful, especially to those millennials in Generation Z. And so we started with this. This is what we always start with, a blank sheet of paper. That's where we start. And the question becomes, first, who is the audience? Who are we trying to reach? And with what experiences are we trying to reach them? What story are we trying to draw them into? Millennials, if you want to take away, here's one. Millennials want to be a part of something larger than themselves. And that is especially true with Generation Z. And then we ask the question, from what branding or iconography can we pull to create an experience? 
Now, that icon that you see at the top of that third column there is Tommy Trojan. He's on the center of campus in a beautiful bronze sculpture that's been there for almost 100 years. But his sword that he's holding, the Trojan sword, had never been brought out as a piece of iconography. One of the things that USC wanted to do was express something transcendent about the All-Americans. So our folks started sketching, and they came up with this sketch. What would it be like if we created an All-American walk? And at the end of that walk, if we placed the sword in some sort of column structure, and we made it an experience that both the student athletes and the fans and the donors could engage in. And Bill and Nadine Tilley saw that concept, they're, they're alumni, of uh, USC, and they stepped up and said, we'll fund that experience for three quarters of a million dollars. And they did it from a conceptual sketch because it resonated with them and it drew them in. So we indeed told their story of philanthropy there on the site, and we created this all-American walk with articulated bronze plaques that the student athletes could touch or fans could touch or have their photo made with. And as soon as we did that, we put at the end of, of the walkway this Trojan sword in a column and surrounded the base with the five attributes of the Trojan, scholarly, courageous. And as soon as we put the exhibit in, this is what happened. No prompting, no scripting. Nobody told these guys what to do. I, we couldn't believe it. This is footage is from an iPhone the day that we installed it. Nobody told them. The student athletes really had something to grab hold of. That's powerful, but it's not as powerful as this next story. See, that's Marquise Lee. You may know him. He plays in the NFL now. Marquise is placing his plaque, which is a new tradition, on that wall. We interviewed Marquise the day that he placed his plaque. We said, what's it like to, to, to place your plaque here? And you see, he said, you know, it's really simple. You see that empty space? He said, I walked by this for a year. I played with those other three guys whose names were above me, and I just said it as my goal to be on that wall. Now, that's powerful. It's even more compelling if you know this. When he was eight years old, Marquise and his sister were given up as wards of the state. Marquise's older brother, one of them is dead from a gang-related murder. The other one is in prison from attempted murder. Here's a guy whose all the odds were against him, and all he needed was a sense of inspiration and hope with which to engage. So when he put his plaque there, it was one more monumental moment. And then what we couldn't believe is what would happen next is that the fans would literally grab hold of this and they would Instagram and tweet about it because the millennials in Generation Z want to be a part of a story larger than themselves and through Instagram and Twitter they curate a narrative of their life through these mountaintop experiences with, it, with which they're involved. These high point experiences. And they want likes in order to validate that they are indeed a noteworthy experience. So that's how it worked for USC. I want to show you just a couple of others that, that they're in the academic area. That's an athletic uh, area. We've been doing uh, this kind of work now for, for about seven or eight years. We've been in business for about 25 years. And the majority of our work is in athletics, both uh, college athletics and professional athletics. Uh, we're working with the Dallas Cowboys as they relocate their, their headquarters from Valley Ranch, Texas, to Frisco, Texas. And what we're seeing, though, is folks in your peer group are starting to, to catch on to this and realize this is an important tool to deliver that strategic objective from the president or chancellor of the university, the C-suite, about differentiation. So for the Wyoming Gateway Center, the Marion H. Rochelle Gateway Center that houses career services, that houses job placement, that houses their alumni office and their foundation. We did all of the messaging and storytelling, including this incredible experiential 30-foot wall timeline. Now, I want you to notice those two screens that are floating on the timeline because they actually roll. They're actually on tracks. And as you roll over each decade, the, the dynamic content on the screen comes to life for the user. Okay, So you pull it back and forth, and the content comes to life. And people of all ages, because the older folks like those photographs and like that history, and young folks just like the technology, people of all ages can engage with that content. So that's the new Welcome Center at the University of Wyoming. 
uh, up in Bowling Green, Kentucky, Western Kentucky University, uh, they, they created a, a, an honors and international college, two messages that they were trying to create. And there's another university in Kentucky. There's several, right? And so this kind of, you know, other university or stepsister university, if you will, really wanted to make a bold statement about their global connection. How many students they've had that not only study abroad, how many international students that they're drawing. So when you walk in the building, you can't miss the messaging and the narrative. But even on the outside, the directionals just tell you their proximity to the rest of the cities around the world. And you open the door, the big red towel, and then you're immersed in something that says global, that suggests something that is, again, international in flavor. Tell where the students have been and studied across the globe and what sort of diplomatic relations they've had as a part of their, their studies there. And then things that are, that are happening new. This is the USC Marshall School. This is in concept design, but a new video wall we're putting in there where the user can come in and find these points of engagement across the globe where Marshall School alumni are engaged in activity. What they're doing in various communities internationally, the kinds of business, the kinds of roles they're involved in, and how those Marshall School students are affecting the economy globally. We believe in the power of story. It, it, it's just died in the way that we work and the way we think. Uh, we believe it's critically important. We believe that's why you read a great book. We believe that's why we watch a great movie. And we believe that's why the Dallas Cowboys are going to open up their headquarters and their practice facilities to fans. It's because people want to be immersed in a story all kinds of studies that talk about why that's important. As you think about your role and why your role matters, I want to just be the guy at this conference who says that it does. You touch pieces, buildings that leave a legacy. What happens in the work of your creation is really important. It says something about the community. And I just want you to be reminded of that today. I also want you to know of a pragmatic matter. We brought with us, uh, and Tracy, my colleague over here to the left, has a copy of this for you if you'd like one. But we brought with us a white paper that shows some of the research we've done in this field uh, and how other folks are doing it. Thank you for your time.